was dying, actually, to go to the loo back there. I really was. Now I kept thinking, now I kept thinking, I'll miss a bit, you know, I'll miss a bit that's really important. And I, I, they said to me, go on, you must stand by. And I was glued to it, watching. What about, I'd like to ask all of you, actually, about, uh, about critics. I what loathe is... them, and I've gone on record of saying how much I loathe them so many times. It's almost become commonplace, you know, I regard them as... But can I've you... always said that the eunuchs and the harem, you know, they're there every night, they see it done every night, but they can't do it themselves. <laughs> Useless, you see, and there's a marvelous... But they're not always, <coughs> Ken, because always there's a grain of truth. That's what's so unnerving. Hardly ever, and even if oh, there Ken. were, even if there were, Maggie, I would say this. They might, uh, they might, in what they say, be saying something true, but they've hardly ever earned the right to say it. You see, that's well, the point. Yes, that's the real point. Yes. You see, people like um, these sort of, you know, would-be doyens, they write in Sunday newspapers and look upon themselves as sort of, you know, augurs of what's good taste and what's bad taste. They sit there as though from Olympian heights, you know, discussing other people's work and often damning them in the process. I could show you cuttings that name people as being the best, you know, one of the critics said, not only the best in the Western Hemisphere, nay, N-A-Y, nay, nay oh. the world. <laughs> and went on to name people that have trod a path into oblivion. I've not heard of them ever since, you know. <laughs> and so you begin to think, well, what they were, worth? They're all useless, you see. Yes. Because half the time, they're not really doing what a critic should do, that is communicate some sort of affection and love for his subject to I the reader. Really they're really not doing that. What they're really doing is turning a fashionable phrase that might make them well known, them a reputation, you know what I mean? I yes. don't honestly yes. think you yes. can lump them all together because there are, you know, there are some serious ones. I mean, and you can learn things the, 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 basically, sometimes change. You're, 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 you would say that they're, they're, to put it crudely, pleasuring themselves rather than... than well, they're poor sure. things, they've got a rotten job, obviously. I mean, awesome. it's a rotten job, I admit, I admit that. Like it's a, it's a very awesome. frustrating job. I know a lot of them are sort of, what is it, shorts? A lot of them were frustrated playwrights mm. or something. Um, a lot of them frustrated actors, probably. But, um, you know, um, Russell Lovell said that uh, there's something fundamentally ridiculous about criticism insofar as what is good is good without us saying so. Yes, yeah. yes. You know what I mean? Yes, and that, I suppose, really exposes so, the whole thing. And it also brings out the truth of what you said, that the um, communicating enthusiasm Precisely. is what you should do. That's what they I should be doing. Now, there are it's certain hard. people that can do it. Mm -hmm. There are. I mean, uh, I've read Rex Reed, you know, those profiles in New Yorker, and he really does communicate an atmosphere. You do feel, if you're reading that kind of writer, mm. you do feel something of the, the atmosphere of the show, the entertainment he enjoyed, mm. and he um, infects yes. you. And this really happens with good teaching, doesn't it? A good teacher. He yeah. takes you into uh, the realm of English literature, poetry. I mean, my English teacher did. He infected me with a, with a spirit of poetry, you know what I mean? And he introduced me to poets. Uh, most, mostly, I must admit, the romantics, probably that was my mel melancholic leaning at the time, Shelley Keats, Byron, these sort of people. And um, I've lived with them ever since. I've enjoyed them because he infected me with them. But he didn't do it in any way distractively. Do you see what I mean? Mm. Mm. He did it with love and affection. Mm. And I'm sure that the real, you know, the criticism that matters yeah. in this sense is that kind of mm. thing, not the thing where they're turning a, a nice phrase, which is a good headline, or something clever, or something catty, or something malignant, which lingers in the memory for a day or so. And it's certainly only for a day or so. Do, do, do you get really melancholic about... Uh, yes. About, do you, do you really I can't some? bear it. I don't belong to a press-cutting agency. There was a time when I longed to see my name in print. Now I see it with dread. Well, and, uh, I, and does it I, really affect you? Oh, I, I always believe it's true. I believe anything well, that's, that's said that's against trouble. me is true. And anything that's said in my favor is flattery. Really? Yes, I never can believe <laughs> yes. that I'm any good at all. No, I, I think, again, well, I, I think yes. all artists desperately need the reassurance from the outside yes. of their own worth. They haven't got it within. Yes. I think this is one of the paradoxes of, uh, of all art, don't you? I mean, yes. that, that though they may appear very often, artists, to be people of power and strength, yes. in actual fact, the reverse is true. They're the most yes. vulnerable people in the world. Yes. I remember going backstage and meeting my idol at the time, Sir Godfrey Toe, yes. and he actually said to me, I and mean, he was giving a marvellous performance in the air, it's the Haymarket, and I was sitting in his dressing room, I was full of awe, I was a very young actor, and very green, and I couldn't even find words to say how marvellous I thought his performance was. And he said to me, I've been terribly downcast because a woman brought her little boy to see it. He was ten, and he said, my trousers were too high and the socks were showing. <laughs> <laughs> and that worried him. Did, can, and uh, Maggie, can we talk a little bit now? We've been talking a bit about, about showbiz, about something that Sir John was talking about earlier. 
about the whole business of, of preservation and this sort of thing. Is it something that, that concerns you too? I mean, are you basically on Sir John's side and what he says about this? Hmm? Yes, I am. I, 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 I see the problem in another way because I have two brothers and they're both architects and they say, but if we go on keeping things standing, uh, what else can we build? I suppose really our problem here is that we are just a small island. Mm. But the examples of planning light that you do see, things like the dreadfulness of the Elephant and Castle, which used to be it's a place of humanity awful. and warmth uh -huh. and people, which is now just a concrete yeah. desert yes. and a mess and an absolute disgrace. Yes. And what they've turned the Euston Centre into is the same thing, and just, a, just a blight. Frightful. And this sort of thing is I really an ab absolute disgrace. Moreover, any there? government, What's well, exactly, that? I mean, any government, and it was the Labour government, I believe, which had the power, could have, <laughs> could have, yeah, could have, could have turned the whole thing into flats for people, left the whole thing standing empty all the time. It was a national scandal, did nothing about it at all. The Office Development Permit, it was introduced by, by um, who was the man, um, the Lord, um, you know, the man that was Foreign Secretary, who was he out of the Labour government, government administration? Oh, he introduced, uh, the, 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 Brown, uh, George Brown. George Brown. Right. Yes, he yes. introduced the office development uh, prohibition, you know, he stopped offices being built, but only in the last two years of the government, when it should have been done miles before yeah. the first act of our office socialist government, a government which says it's socialist, the first act they should make, is to stop all that and say, homes. Home's the most important thing. Makes me sick when I read all this crap about, oh, let's have a youth club, let's have a theatre and built, or let's have something else built. No good all that. Cultural activities are no good if there's no home to go to, is it? Absolutely true. You must have a home. Yes. So the first and requisite is a home. And possible on the ground. Well, I was going to say... <laughs> Very angry that. Yes. Mm. It really makes me very angry. Doesn't it you to pass a great thing empty, a great skyscraper mm. empty? Right. I absolutely I think agree. it's an absolute scandal. Yes. And yet they can all get worked up over a, a couple of pounds in, in their pay packet or something and go on strike. Why can't they have why can't I mean if unions really care, if they're really socialistic and say we care about our fellow man, why can't they force, why can't they march about something like that? Instead of another pound yes, but for that, themselves. But why not a few pounds for somebody else who's really hard up? But that's not the what? union's problem. It's not the union's fault. That, that, that yes, look, what is the statue outside the TUC? Have you looked at that statue? But the statue outside the TUC depicts a man helping, doesn't it? He's helping up another man who's on the ground. Yes. And that statue symbolises what the TUC stands for, doesn't it? Of course. Right, well, when a union does something like jeopardising the work of their fellow men, if you stop trains, people can't get to their work, can they? Can they? They can't get to work even. So in doing what you want for yourself, you're jeopardizing your fellow men, aren't you? Yes. Well, why can't you act in concert with your fellow men? Why do you have to do something which endangers the livelihood of your fellow men? When that statue represents exactly that, helping, because it not might, hindering. Because it might be that the fellow, um, that one fellow, to take two workers at one fellow, is a lot worse off than the other worker. They're not all equal, are they? I mean, if they were all equal, there'd be no problem. Precisely, but it comes down to a question of morality. You don't no, just no. work for another pound. When I took my job at three pound ten a week, I had seven in small parts. I come out of the army, forty-seven. That's what I got. Forty-seven or three pound ten a week. My digs were twenty-five bob all in, and the rest I had the soap and the fags, you know. And we got bit of our picture shop round the bend because I did my own cleaning. <laughs> but. I saved, and because I wanted to do the job and wanted to do it well, I got on, I got another rep fortnightly, and then after that I got monthly rep, you know, and I got a bit better. I did seven years in the provinces before I came to London. And I think if you're prepared to do that kind of thing, you're doing it, what are you doing it for? You're not saying I want another pound all the time, you're saying I want to do the work better. Yes, but now, that was the kind of morality I was brought up with. But don't do a job just for what you get, you do the job because but, but, you want to do it well. Oh, but Kenneth, can I say I think that's crap? <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, I, mean, I really... I've never been so insulted. <laughs> uh, can I... Who signed you on? <laughs> You see, it's all very well you saying that. It's all very well all of us here in jobs that are creative, where you can see if you go work, if you've got a talent, you can get to the top and you can get, you know, handsome living. Now, you're not going to tell me that you were going to be compared with somebody who's sticking door handles on a car for, 20, for, 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 for 10 hours a day, five days a week, that, that, that he's not going to get frustrated, that he doesn't deserve an extra quid if he wants one. Of course his, his work, work ethic is money. It's got to be. He doesn't get the satisfaction from the job that we get. I mean, that's true. You, of course, it's talking. True. You've talked. Maybe, I, 
Of course it's true. Insinuate, his, his inference is the man who's sitting the doorknobs on has got a job that's monotonous and dreary. Absolutely. What do you think doing something night after night? I've done this play now at the Globe. I mean, I've said it so many times, I'm beginning to wonder what it means, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you keep on saying anything long enough and you begin to think you're daft, don't you? I mean, that, that's the trouble. I mean, do, everybody does seem to think that our work is glamorous. It's fabulous. Why? They're fabulously glad. It's not at all. It's a simple business of self-discipline and going on night after night and doing it as well as you can. Right, and if I have to stick right. doorknobs on, and I've done it, yes. I've stuck doorknobs on, I've painted my own walls right. when I haven't got the money to employ a decorator, I do it because I like doing it and I want to do it well. But the other difference is, Kenneth, that the guy who goes on strike is not earning your salary. He's not earning four or five hundred quid a week. What about the period I didn't oh, have any success sure. and I spent, what, seven years in the provinces bumming around? That wasn't very successful. No, of course not. But there was always, there was always because you backed your talent, because your talent went in, a, in, in, in an area where talent pays off in the end, then you had a horizon. You could see ahead. Well, what are you asking for? A people... world where every single job leads to some marvellous end? Yes. Well, all yes. jobs can't be like that. Well, pr precisely. Th and that's the problem. But nevertheless... I mean, so therefore you must, you must allow people their frustrations. No, you, they must accept their limitations, surely. Oh, oh, come on. They must be allowed to... This is, uh, that, no, that, 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 that's a Superman argument. It isn't. Uh, Voltaire said every man must dig in his own bit of garden. There wasn't much wrong with Voltaire's philosophy, was there? No. Sir John, <laughs> could we have a calm word? Because Kenneth and I are getting rather excited. <laughs> well, it, <laughs> By the way, do you know, what they, you know what they say his last words were, Voltaire? No. They said, but apparently a priest came and they said, you know, will you now, will you now make your peace and renounce the devil? Renounce the devil and all his works. And they said, oh, it's a bit late in the day to be making enemies. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Sir John, were you going to say something? Um, about... I've forgotten. <laughs> And I don't blame you at all. I don't blame you at all. Poetry. Let's talk about poetry. For well, a while, um, you, because... some of his lines have absolutely reverberated in my head. And yes. um, we were talking about you the other day. You weren't there. And Ma Ma <laughs> Maggie was quoting a thing of yours, which has always stayed in her head. What was that line you were and saying? Phone for the fish knives, Norman. The phone for the fish knives, Norman. Oh, that yeah. poem. Yes. Sir. And I was saying the one that always stays in my head is the you know the prayer of the lady about the air raids. And says, Lord, keep beneath thy special care, 149 Cadogan Square. <laughs> Which I love. Mm. Yes. And come friendly bombs and fall on slough. Yes, you shouldn't mention oh, the no, trouble that. I got oh. that. Did you have trouble in there? Yes, that was when I was a prep school master on 30 quid a term. <laughs> in Gerard's Cross. <laughs> really? yes, all in, of course, but yes. still didn't leave you much for cigarettes. No. Yes. But no harpy. No. <laughs> no. And what, what kind of problem did it, did it create? Did you... Well, they... Uh, you can't libel a corporation, thank goodness. You can <laughs> libel an individual, like the borough engineer, or s somebody like that, but not a conglomerate body. But they've always, uh, they've been very nice, generous to me in Slough, considering I was about 19 when I wrote that. And I'm now, goodness knows how old, 65, <laughs> nearly 66. Uh, why it should be remembered, I can't think. In those days, <laughs> There was a, it was very, everyone was very horrified by the new tendencies of uh, things coming. We could see the evil world of tall skyscrapers and nothingness, yes. we've been mm. describing, arriving. And that was what the anger of that poem was about. And the lack of consideration for the individual as a separate person. Absolutely. Why, I, I must go on for a second, why I like actors very much and it's because they're givers not takers yes. and it's the takers we're always fighting against you have to spend your whole time every day doing that thing of being en rapport with the audience very exhausting yes Can what one poet called the eternal reciprocity of tears you see, you, to understand about comedy is to understand that. Because the pathos, which has got to be inherent in a comedy performance, if you haven't got it, you haven't got any comedy. If they're not really basically sorry and really identifying with your situation. There's a poem by Hal Burton somewhere about, you know, Caesar must die in them. You know, their lives must be rehearsed, their deaths must pass. Mm -hmm. Kenneth, we are sadly running out of time. It's a disgrace, you say. Oh, such a long oh, I, I asked for over an hour last time. <laughs> <laughs> I was sandwiched in for a couple of minutes. It's a disgrace. <laughs> it really is. I tell you what, 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 you don't have to make good use of those couple <laughs> of minutes, though, don't you? <laughs>